But tonight, not going to take long at all. And uh, if I could have your attention for a few moments, I, I won't take long at all tonight. But again, I want to treat you uh, like an adult. Uh, I want to treat you like an adult. So I always say, you know, you have my respect until you do something to lose it. So uh, I respect each and every one of you. Um, and I'm just going to ask that that's reciprocated, not even necessarily for me, but for those around you that want to lock in during this time. So um, let's be respectful. Let's not talk during this time. It's not going to take long at all. We're going to have fun tonight. I'm going to be out on the dance floor. But uh, I want to ask that you act mature and not talk during this time. Is that okay? Can we do that? Yes? Thank you. Thank you so much. If you got your Bibles or if you want to take notes, I do encourage you to take notes if you want to write down a couple things tonight. I'm going to be reading from the book of Ecclesiastes and chapter 11, and we'll start in verse 4. He who observes the wind will not sow. Uh, sowing here, this is not like needle and thread sowing. You're like, I'm not going to sow. It's too windy. It's not that kind of sowing. This is a farming term. It means planting. So when you see the word sow, think planting. He who observes the wind will not sow or will not plant. He who regards the clouds will not reap. Again, reap is a farming term, means to get back. So notice here, Solomon wrote this book, the wisest man that ever lived. He wrote this book, and the wisest person is discussing the weather. I think it's so interesting. He's talking about the wind. He's talking about clouds. He's talking about rain. So let's drop down to verse five. You don't know the way, you don't know what is the way of the wind or how bones grow in a child, so you don't know the workings of God. Shh, 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 shh. that's where I'm gonna ask you guys to lock in here, okay? Come on, lock in, let's lock in. Just be respectful of those around you. I'm not gonna take long at all, and then you can talk as much as you want after. Cool? Cool. Thank you, sir. So you don't know the works of God who makes everything. But in the morning you sow and in the evening do not withhold your hand for you don't know which will prosper or whether, well, that's a different kind of weather, that's a W-H-E-T-H-E-R, not the W-E-A-T-H-E-R, I know grammar. Both alike will be good. Notice that there's two different types of weather we're talking about. The W-E-A-T-H-E-R, that's like the wind, the rain, the clouds, that's that kind of weather. But then there's also the weather, the W-H-E-T-H-E-R, which is either this or that, this or that. And what I wanna talk to you about tonight, very briefly, is about remaining unaffected by the weather. Remaining unaffected by the weather. Not letting the weather affect your weather. Not letting the W-E-A-T-H-E-R affecting your W-H-E-T-H-E-R. Not letting the weather of life, the storms of life, affect whether or not you're gonna live for God. Meteorologists' job is to predict the forecast. They collect data about the atmospheric pressures and a bunch of other scientific stuff that I don't know. And if you know anything about meteorologists, how many of y'all know their accuracy is not great, right? Like it stinks, it's horrible. How great would it be to have a job where it didn't really matter how accurate you were? Like you're a doctor, you're going in for surgery, and you're like, hello, I'm your doctor today, and I'm pretty sure it's the left leg we're amputating today. <laughs> yeah, pretty sure, pretty sure, most likely. Like what? Like how many of y'all know accuracy is important? You're like a lawyer. Your honor, we're pretty sure he's not guilty. No, it's like you kind of need to be accurate. It'd be great to have a job that didn't really matter how accurate you were. But people have tried to predict the weather for years. Like y'all were probably, most of y'all were born that year. But I remember 2012, everybody thought the world was ending. They're like, no, it's the, 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 the moon and it says this and we're going to die and Yellowstone's going to erupt and uh, so much panic. And then it's like, oh, yeah, it was fine. But Solomon's saying that we, we as people, we have a tendency, and as, in, as inaccurate as we think it is to predict the weather in life, he's saying that we as people have a tendency to try and predict how our own life is going to work out. We try to predict how God's going to work in our life. And he's saying, hey, as inaccurate as you think predicting the weather is, predicting what your tomorrow's going to look like, what your future's going to look like, is even worse. It's even less accurate. So he's giving us this analogy in farming terms. He's saying that if you're a farmer and you go out every day, and every day you go out and you're looking at the clouds, and you're looking at the rain, and you've got the seed that you need to plant to grow your harvest, to grow your crop, you're looking at it and you're like, no, I'm not going to plant today. I'm going to go away. Uh, it's a little windy. I'm not going to plant today. 
Uh, it's a little rainy. It might rain later. I don't know. I'm not going to plant today. Uh, it's a little, I don't know. I'm not going to plant today. He's saying that if you do that, inevitably, as a farmer, you're going to fail. If you don't ever take effort to try and plant something, to try and do something, you're going to fail. And what he's saying here is that in life, people do the same thing. They try to look at how things are going in life. They try to look at and see the things that they're up against, the storms that they're up against. And as a result, they never end up gaining anything in life because they're always so afraid of making a choice or a decision because they're afraid of what the future is going to look like. But what he's saying is that there's no way to predict with 100% accuracy the workings or the way of God. There's no way to know absolute certainty the works of God. He says you don't know what today is going to hold. You don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. You don't know if what you try to achieve is going to work out. You don't know whether or not it's actually going to work out. You don't know whether or not that relationship is actually going to work out. You don't know whether or not this school choice is actually going to work out. You don't know whether or not that team is actually going to work out. You don't know if it's actually going to work out. So you have to be careful to not allow the weather, the W-E-A-T-H-E-R, to determine your motivation. You cannot in life be motivated based solely off of how things look because looks can be deceiving. If you keep waiting around for everything in your life to fall into place and to be perfect, you'll spend your whole life waiting. There was a man recently who did a study. He surveyed over 100 families for 10 years. 10 years he studied all of these families and he studied everything that was happening in their relationships with the husband and wife, everything that was happening with the kids, everything that was happening with the finances, everything that was happening at their workplace for 10 years in their schools. 10 years this man studied over 100 families and what he found out, this statistic is crazy, that in 10 years... About only 10% of the time was everything going okay for those families. Only about 10% of the time was everything in a place where they thought, yeah, this is okay. So what he found out is that 90% of the time, every one of those young people and every one of those parents, stuff was going crazy. Crap hit the fan. Their finances were crazy. Their relationships were crazy. Their careers, their jobs were crazy. School was crazy. Everything was crazy for 90% of the time. So what am I trying to say right now? That if you're waiting for things to all settle down before you make a move, or you're waiting for things to settle down before you try that church thing, or you're waiting for things to settle down before you make whatever decision it is that you're trying to make, can I tell you, you're going to live your life disappointed. You're going to live your life disappointed if you're always waiting for things to fall together. Because what this man found out was that 10% of the time, life was okay. But 90% of the, 90 of the time, the weather was crazy. 90% of the time, the weather was acting up. 90% of the time, it was financial waves. It was relationship tornadoes. Some of y'all are in a relationship tornado right now. You're like, get me out. Help. <laughs> you know, maybe it's... The weather you're facing is the winds of worry and of stress. Maybe the, the storms you're facing, maybe it's storms of your health, your physical health, your emotional health, your mental health. But when I think about storms, I think about one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Not a story, a real, a real encounter found in Mark chapter 4. And I'd like to read it for you very briefly. Mark Four, verse 35. And on the same day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took Jesus along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Then he arose and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and they said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obeys him? What I want to do is I want to give you a few points from those verses that we read, and then we're done. Just a few points. We're going to go through those verses, and then we're done. First point I want you to realize, if you want to write this down, it starts by Jesus saying, let us cross over to the other side. So the first point I want you to realize in life, 
God wants to take you places. God wants to take you places. Here, these disciples, all these men, they're at sea, and they're ministering to people, and they're doing church stuff, and they just got done doing a whole bunch of stuff. Jesus just got done preaching, probably at a service like this, and they're tired, and Jesus says, hey, let's cross over to the other side. You know, they're doing the work that they're supposed to be doing. They're focusing on the day-to-day. And I think so many times in life, we get so caught up in right now. We get so caught up in today. What do I need right now? Like, how many of y'all hate being patient for things? Any, yeah, I want things now, immediately. We get so caught up. But we need to remember that God wants to take us places. We get so caught up in how things look right now and forget that God has a future plan for us. We all know that if the farmer, like Solomon was talking about, never puts anything in the ground, it's over for him right? He's got to be thinking about the future. He can't just enjoy the harvest. He's got to be thinking about what's next. Come on. Now, there are reasons, I think, that we as people decide to, 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 to not go places, right? A lot of times we get comfortable where we're at. We get comfortable where we're at, or we think about change. Like my wife, my lovely wife, Savannah, I love her to death. She hates change, <laughs> She, like, hates change. Like, if we're going to go on a date, and I'm like, hey, surprise, we're going on a date. Well, when are we going? What time? Where are we going? When will we be leaving here? Will there be traffic along the way? Like, she has to know every little detail. It's not enough to know, hey, we're going somewhere. Like, it's going to be fun. It's going to be great. Would you just trust me? We can answer all the little detail-y questions later, but just trust me that I got a fun date planned for us. And I think in the same time, right, we, we, we think about the future and we get stressed out. We think about college and we think about life after middle school and life after high school. And we think about that and we think, no, 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 I'm fine here. I'm just fine where I'm at. I'm fine where I'm at. But you can't get paralyzed by external forces, Because God's the giver of dreams. He gives you dreams. He gives you goals. And God wants you to go places. You have those dreams, those gifts, those talents that God has given you. You have what's in your heart. And if you have what God put in your heart in your life, day in, day out, if you're willing to say, God, I'm going to go places. God, I'm willing to step out of my comfort zone. I'm willing to think about my future. I'm willing to go places. And I'm going to trust you with the future. Then you become a force to be reckoned with. There's going to be self-doubt, right? There's going to be self-doubt when it comes to stepping out. But you're not created to stay down and stay put. You're created to step up and stand out. You're created to stand out, and God wants you going places. The second point I want to talk to you about is if you read along on the scripture, so Jesus tells them, hey, get in the boat. So he gets in the boat, and he says, we're going to the other side. Let's go. So we're here. And Jesus says, hey, we're going places. I want you going places. I know you're content with where you're at, but I got more for you. I got more for you. So we're going to cross over to the other side. The Bible says that when they get going onto the boat, it's a little bit bigger than this little rinky-dink thing, but it don't matter. It's not that big. When they get going, the Bible says that a violent storm erupts. Violent storm and the wind and the waves are breaking against the boat, so much so that the, bro- the, the boat starts to break apart. The disciples, they're freaking out. They're experienced sailors. This is what they do for a living. And in that moment, they know they're likely going to die. The waves are crashing against the boat, and it's, it's this crazy moment, and they conclude, we're done. We're done for. That's it. But Jesus is in the boat, and the Bible says he's sound asleep. He's just resting. He's got his little pillow. He's down in the boat. He's fine. The second point I want you to realize is that the storm doesn't take God by surprise. The storm doesn't take God by surprise. He is sound asleep. He's perfectly content. The disciples are the ones that are freaking out. Jesus is fine. They're panicking. He's going that night. They're freaking out. He's like, what? What day is it? The point I'm trying to make is, isn't it so funny that the people who aren't in control are freaking out about losing control when the one who is in control is sleeping sound? Here they're freaking out, thinking they have any say over the wind and the waves, and the one who does is perfectly content. Shouldn't that tell you something? I, I, I remember the first time I ever flew on a plane, I, I was given this tip. It was amazing because I was so afraid of flying. And they said, well, what you got to do is you got to look to somebody who's an experienced flyer. And if they're not panicking, then you're fine. And if they are panicking, you should panic. 
So I was like, okay, that's a really good piece of advice. So I'm flying. My first flight was a flight to Peru. It was like six and a half hours, so terrified. Like shaking, clammy, sweating, ah. But I remember my good friend, Pastor Kyle, or Uncle Kyle, as you guys know him. He, he's flown like a million times, so he's sitting next to me. We start hitting a little bit of turbulence, and I like grab my chair, and I look over at him, and he's fine. And I was like, okay, we're good. And then we hit another patch of turbulence. The flight attendant like falls on the ground. And I'm like, no, it's fine. Kyle's fine. I look over at Kyle. He's like this. And I'm like, oh, God, this is it. This is it. <laughs> we were fine, clearly. But. but shouldn't it tell you something? If you're freaking out and you're going crazy and Jesus is calm, shouldn't that give you some assurance that things are going to be okay? It should give you some assurance that things aren't okay. But so many of us, we walk around thinking that we have all this control over our lives and not just control over other things, but we, we put that pressure on ourselves. We walk around like with all this guilt, with all this shame, with all these mistakes from our past, thinking that we're somehow big enough to mess up God's plan for us. And God would say, hey, you're not big enough to outrun my love and mess up so bad. I'm still in control. It's okay. Your mistakes aren't too bad. You're not too far gone. You've not messed up so much that God can't make it right. You're freaking out, and he's sound asleep. You got to quit freaking out on God. We can't live our life wondering whether or not it's going to work out. God says it will prosper, then it will prosper. You don't know how it will prosper. You don't know when it will prosper. But what you do know is that you live, if you live your life predicting the weather, you're going to feel stressed out all the time. But can I give you some comfort and let you know you can't predict it and control anything anyway. Now that's a scary thought. That, that's a scary thought for some people. But for me, it's not so scary because I know who I put my trust in. And I don't have to be in control because the one who controls it all is leading my life. Thank goodness that when life's going crazy and all hell's breaking loose, you've got somebody on this boat called life. Because how many of y'all know this, this boat called life can get kind of crazy and the storms can come against us, the waves can come, the wind can come, and we might be freaking out on the surface, but if you just have a little bit of a deep relationship with Jesus, you've got somebody asleep on the boat that's there with you. That can bring you peace. So that leads us to the next point. He was in the stern asleep on a pillow and they awoke him. And they said to Jesus, teacher, do you not care that we are dying? Jesus, don't you care that we're dying? The third point is don't let circumstances determine God's care for you. Because here, I think we can all relate to the disciples in this moment. I think we can all point to a time in our life where we're, the storm is raging, winds are blowing, waves are crashing, and you would just scream out, God, do you even care? God, do you even care what I'm going through? Are you even there when I'm praying? God, do you even care about what I'm facing right now? When the stakes are high and what you're facing is life and death, maybe it's in life or in your relationships or with your family or with your finances, the stakes are high and you're looking at it and you're wondering, does God even care? Does God even care about what I'm going through? How can a God that says he loves me be so out of touch in a moment? How could he be sleeping when I need him? Whoa, whoa. When there's real dangers in my life, what you're doing in that moment is you're allowing the weather to put God's care and God's love for you in question. No matter what the weather is out there, no matter what the storms are going on out there, can I encourage you and tell you that there's a way you can make sure you don't allow that weather to affect your heart. Psalms 126 says it like this, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. What's the scripture saying here? That even in grief, because there's times where you experience loss in life, Pain, I'm talking about pain and hurt so deep that you don't even know how to articulate it. Even in struggle, even in sadness, even in discouragement, even in tears, guess what? You have to keep sowing. What does that look like? Guess what? You gotta keep showing up at church. You gotta keep praying. You gotta keep reading the word. You gotta keep giving Jesus a try. Why? Because even if you don't understand what it's going to do, even if you don't understand, even if your health is struggling, your tendency is to pull back and to withhold and to say, I don't really feel like praising God right now. I'm looking at the clouds. I'm looking at the storm. I'm looking at the waves. I'm looking at the wind. I'm listening to what people have told me. 
But according to scripture, that if you do nothing and if you withhold, and if you say, God, I'm not going to praise you, God, I'm not going to trust you. If, you, if you withhold, you without certainty, or excuse me, with certainty, will fail. If you withhold and pull back and say, God, I'm not going to trust you here, it says you will fail. But if you decide to take what God's given you, take what God says to do, which is to reach out, to communicate, to get around the right people, to stay committed, to make sure you're committed in the morning, committed in the evening. And when you can do that, you don't know whether or not it will work. You don't know how it's going to work. You don't know when it's going to work. But can I encourage you that it will work? God is a faithful God. He's faithful and he's good. We trust him. He provides. We do what we can do so that God can do what only he can do. Not look to the clouds, not look to the wind, not look to our problems, but why don't we turn our eyes towards our heavenly father? If we'll keep obeying God, if we keep loving God, we keep showing up, eventually you're gonna find that rescue that he's promised us. That leads me to the fourth point in this scripture. The disciples, they're on the boat, the wave comes, they're crashing, they're broke, their boat's breaking apart. Jesus is sleeping. He's going that night. Disciples, they run in, they wake him up. Jesus, Jesus, don't you care that we're gonna die? So the Bible says Jesus gets up, and in verse 39, he arose, he rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, peace be still. Jesus spoke, peace be still. And it was after he spoke that, that the wind and the waves calmed down. My fourth point is that you can find peace in the middle of the storm. The storm is real. Death was on the door. The threat is very, very strong. It's very possible that the storm is going to take them out. And in the midst of facing death, Jesus says, peace, be still. See, here's what people need to understand. Because people talk about the word peace all the time, and people get it wrong all the time. People think, oh, I need peace in my life. P people think that peace is the absence of a storm. It's not. It's about finding strength and endurance while you're still in the storm. Peace is different than relief. You can't confuse the two. People will say, oh, I just need to stop going to church. So I don't, oh, I feel, I feel peace. No, you don't. You feel relief, which is temporary. When you're working out and you're going hard, you gotta find some kind of motivation to keep you going. If you quit the workout, you're like, oh, I feel peace about that. No, you don't, you feel relief and you're no closer to that goal you want. When you quit something, you're going to feel relief. But that's not what peace is. Peace, the Bible says in Philippians 4, 7, is it's the peace from God passes all understanding. It's not even logical. Peace is when somebody can get a bad doctor's report. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah, there's pain. And they can still be a light and encouragement to people around them. Peace is when you're faced with tragedy, faced with the storm. You can still lift your hands and praise God. I look across this room. You think the people that have their hands lifted got everything going together for them? Man, I know people in here, that the, the same people that have their hands lifted are the same people that are going through hell right now. That's a peace that passes understanding. It's not logical. That's a kind of peace that you would look at somebody and say, you of all people should have the right to go and make all these bad decisions and go live however you want to live and not love God and not be in church. But no, you got a peace that gives you a strength, a hope that doesn't put you to shame. And that comes from Jesus. That comes from knowing who he is. My question is, what are you going to do when you're faced with a storm? What's your response in a storm? What's the church's response in a storm? Because sometimes I think in life we get hurt so that we can better help others that hurt. I think sometimes you have to go through situations in life and as horrible as they may be, my Bible says that what the enemy meant for evil, God can turn it for good that you can then be a light to somebody else who's experienced what you've had to experience. And you can say, hey, I've been there. Because it's different when you can say, hey, I know what you're going through. I know what you're facing. And can I tell you, it's not over. It's not the end for you. There's greater things ahead of you. God's got more for you. Sometimes you'll get hurt. And we're asking, why, God? Why did you allow this storm to happen? But could it be that the storm has a purpose? 
Could it be that the storm has a purpose? I think about the times that I've been hurt in my life and the pain I've experienced. It's, better, it's helped me be able to communicate to people better because I'm like, I can say, hey, I've been there. I know what you're going through. I know what you're facing. Storms will come. But what I can do is I can trust that Jesus still loves me in the storm. You can trust that Jesus still loves you in the storm, that he still cares for you when the waves are crashing over you. He still loves you even in the hopeless situation. Whether he cares for you or not should not be in question because he knows how to bring peace in the middle of a storm. He knows how to bring peace right where you're at. He loves us. He's for us no matter what's against us. So Jesus speaks, peace be still. And immediately the waves calm. The wind calms down. And the disciples are standing there probably jaw dropped watching just what happened. And Jesus says, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? He's saying, why is it that you have no faith? Basically, he's saying, why didn't you believe me? Why, why didn't you trust me that I could handle this? The next principle I want to talk to you about is that we need to have a mustard seed kind of faith. See, the story Jesus told to the disciples and the people right before they got on the boat was actually about having faith like a mustard seed. For those of you that don't know, a mustard seed is one of the smallest seeds. It grows into a mustard tree. I think they got a picture of it so you can see just how tiny a mustard seed is. That's a mustard seed. Tiny little thing. It's, it's known for its insanely small size, but its ability to do big things. It grows into this massive tree. And there's this farming term, this scientific term, this botany term called, I'm going to mispronounce it, alelopathy. Yeah, I know words. Look at that. But alelopathy is the inhibition of growth in one species of a plant caused by chemicals produced in another species of plant. So here's an example of alelopathy. Basically what that is, is certain plants can't be around other plants because of the toxins that that other plant puts out. It's unhealthy to that plant. So, for instance, plants cannot grow underneath black walnut trees. They produce a toxic chemical that plants around that tree are not going to make it. And as a result, the chemicals being sent by other plants, they affect the size, they affect the color, even the taste of a vegetable. Like, have you ever heard people say, hey, tomatoes aren't very good this year? Like, oh, the fruit's not there very good. This is a bad year for corn. It's a bad year for this. That is because of alelopathy, because of those crops being around other plants that were toxic to it. But what's very interesting about the mustard seed is that it remains unaffected by its surroundings. It's the same plant no matter where you plant it. It's even shown to be an invasive plant, which means you can take a mustard seed, put it basically in any environment, put it in a toxic environment, put it in a negative environment, and it actually takes those negative toxins, brings it in, and uses it to grow stronger. Jesus said, you and I need to have mustard seed faith. Mustard seed faith. Not just a little bit of faith. But he says it's the kind of faith that if you can ever get to a place when you're looking at your surroundings and everywhere around you is negative, everywhere around you is toxic, everywhere around you there's a storm going, but he's saying that if you can get in that place and you can have that kind of faith that's even just a little bit, even just enough to say, God, I trust you, what God is saying is that nothing will be impossible for you. No matter where you're at, no matter what school you're at, no matter what family you're in, no matter what group of friends you're in, nothing will be impossible for you. No matter what your life looks like. And in our world, we need people. We need you at your schools, in your family, in this nation to be unaffected by your surroundings. There's so much junk out there. People are so mean. There's so much negativity. There's so much toxicity. But when you have that mustard seed kind of faith, a peace that passes all understanding can meet you where you're at. And it doesn't matter whatever environment you're in because guess what? You're going to grow stronger. You're going to grow closer to God. You're going to get closer to achieving those dreams and those goals. 
No matter what life looks like, no matter the battles, no matter the obstacles, we should be able to be in surroundings, take in that negativity that might be out there, and we're called to actually bring that in and say, hey, I'm actually going to turn it around for good. Take the negative conversation and turn it. Take a negative situation and turn it. Take the negative surroundings and turn it. Turn it around. Take the storm and turn it around. Take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it around into good. Look, I'm not a meteorologist. I'm a pastor. So I'm not very good at predicting the weather. We're not very good at predicting about what our lives going to look like. You don't know what tomorrow's gonna look like. I don't know what tomorrow's gonna look like for me. I don't know what it's gonna look like for you. I don't know what I'm eating for dinner tonight. I don't know what next week's gonna hold. But what I do know, the one thing I do know, when you don't know what else to count on and what else is true and who should I listen to and what's, what's a good source for me to receive information from, what I do know is that when you have the word of God planted in your heart and in the morning you sow and you plant that word in your life and in the evening you plant that word in your life and you're about church and you're about the things of God and you're about having a prayer life, can I tell you, nothing will be impossible for you. tell you, you can trust him. He's trustworthy. What a rare quality when someone's trustworthy. Anybody ever had their trust broken? (laughs) He's trustworthy. Nothing, Nothing he's ever said is a lie. He's incapable of lying. Maybe you've ever felt the sting of somebody's betrayal or hurt, felt lack of love, lack of worth. God doesn't just love you. He is love. He is the embodiment of love. No one can love you like he can. No one can fulfill you and make you feel whole like he can. Our job is no matter what's happening in life, no matter what's happening in the weather, you don't allow that to stop you. You remain consistent and say, I'm going to do what God's called me to do. I'm going to live for him. I don't need to get it. I don't need to understand it. My job is to trust him even in the storms because the last principle I want to talk to you about. After Jesus says this in the final verse, verse 41, they said, and they feared exceedingly, And the disciples said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Here's what you guys have to catch. This is so important. This blew my mind when I was reading. I felt felt the words jump out at me as I was reading this. The disciples are with Jesus. They know about Jesus. They're around Jesus. They're listening to Jesus. They're around other people that are listening to Jesus. But they still don't know who he is. They're standing there and they're saying, who's this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? Who is this? This is my final question I want to ask you. I'm going to ask for your undivided attention, please. Your undivided attention. You too as well laugh and smirking. Every week, man. Don't, do not distract from people from this moment. Do you know about Jesus? Do you know of him? Have you heard about him? Or do you know him? I know about a lot of people. I don't really know a lot of people. You can know about people. You can know about Jesus. You can be around people that know about Jesus. Maybe your parents know about Jesus. Maybe your friends know about Jesus. But do you know him? And beyond that, who do you know him as? Just a couple chapters later, Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he asks them because he realizes, he picks up on this, and he says, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some say you're the prophet Elijah. Some say you're Moses. Some say 
you know, you're a prophet, a teacher, a great teacher. And then Jesus asked the question, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter was the first one to speak up, and he says, you are the son of the living God, the lamb that's come to take away the sins of the world. He realized in that moment, Jesus tells him, hey, nobody told you who I was. My father revealed that to you. You know, I remember when I was in a church service like this, I was 16 years old. This would have been 2012. And I had been in church for a few months because I came to church in that summer of August and I'd been coming about every week. I loved it. I didn't know what it was, but I was here and I was like, it was fun. We did these fun events like Silent Disco. We had a blast, ton of cool people. I came because a girl invited me. So I was like, yup. But I remember when I actually met Jesus, when I knew him. It was a moment I'll never forget. Pastor was talking and he said, the decisions, the things that you're making, the the choices that you're making right now, the decisions you're making right now, it's not just affecting you, it's affecting your generations to come. He talked about a legacy, talked about a future. And in that moment, I realized, I said, I was like, I'm looking at my friends that I'm with, I'm looking at the people that I'm surrounding myself with, and I know if I keep going down this path, I'm gonna wind up dead. Like, I shouldn't be in church. I shouldn't. That's an, When I hear scriptures like nothing's impossible for you, I think me being here today is impossible. Is an impossible thing. I shouldn't be here. I'm, I'm no more worthy than you to hold this mic. And I remember in that moment, tears streaming down my face. I realized, man, I was lost and going nowhere quick. But then I heard him, I heard the pastor tell me, about Jesus and told me about who he was. He was God's only son, that God the Father sent Jesus to live on this earth. He lived a perfect life. I heard the pastor talk about our sin, how we're born sinful. We're born separated from God, but it's God's intent that we would have relationship, that we would be together. But because of our sin, our sin needed a sacrifice. And that we come out of moments like Easter, that's us remembering the great sacrifice, that it was my sin, that it was our sin that put Jesus on the cross. That if it had only been for me and my mess ups in life. If it was just me, he still would have died for me. If it was just you and Jesus, you were separated from his father, Jesus still would have died for you. And I remember in that moment, I met Jesus and I knew him as my savior, as the person that saved me, that saved me twice, saved me, yeah, from this life, from making the mistakes, the path I was going down, but saved me eternally that now, because Jesus now stands in the way, And when God the Father looks at me, he doesn't see the sin, he doesn't see the mistakes, he doesn't see the mess-ups and the shortcomings. He sees the perfect sacrifice, Jesus, and he stands in the way and says, Dad, I died for him. I died for her. And right now, with every eye closed and every head bowed, no one's looking around, I'm going to ask you to be absolutely still during this moment. Absolutely quiet. Maybe you know about Jesus. You know about him. You've heard about him. Maybe your parents know about him. Maybe your friends know about him. The Bible says that one day you're going to stand before God. This life, it's temporary. And you might be here and you're saying, Luke, I don't know where I'm going to end up. Heaven's a real place. Hell's a real place. I'm not trying to scare you. That's not my goal. 
It's not a fear tactic. This is a hope tactic. Maybe you're facing storms right now in your life. You're freaking out, but can I tell you, Jesus, he's resting. He's got it under control. But it's important that you turn to him. It matters who you turn to in the storm. It matters where you turn in the storm. And I'm so grateful that I have Jesus to turn to. And you might be here and you say, Luke, I don't have Jesus to turn to. I don't have a relationship with him. What I want to do is I want to give you an opportunity. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to humiliate you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to have you stand up. There's no one looking around right now. But if that's you and you say, Luke, I want to make the decision to make Jesus my Savior. I want to get right with Jesus. I want a relationship with him. If that's you, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand. Again, no one's going to look around. This is a decision between you and him. If that's you, I want to get right with Jesus. Lord, soften hearts tonight. If that's you, on the count of three, lift that hand up. One, two, three, right now, all across this room. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I see that hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. If you don't mind, just keep that hand up. My friend's going to put a card in your hand. It's just got information about your next steps, about that decision you made. And that's how you'll know you can put your hand down. Praise God. Praise God. Keep that hand up. God bless you. I see that hand, young lady. Thank you. I see that hand, young man. God bless you. Thank you. I see you. God bless you. Keep that hand up. My friend's coming. They're going to get a card in your hand. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Praise God. Keep that hand up. My friend, they'll, they'll come to you. They'll get a card in your hand. But everybody else, we're going to put one hand over our heart. We're going to pray this prayer together. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for me. Lord, it was my sin that put you there. If it had only been me, you would have done it just the same. I believe that you're God's only son, that you lived a perfect life, that you died a horrible death on the cross for me. I ask that you wash me, cleanse me, give me a brand new start and a brand new beginning. King Jesus, I will follow you from this day forward for all the days of my life. Father, right now, I thank you for each and every person that raised their hand. Lord, the Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when even just one person makes that decision, God. So we are grateful. Your word says that the old is gone and the new has come. God, I'm grateful for the transformation you did in each young person's life. God, but even those that know you are going to have to face storms in life. So right now, God, I ask for the peace that passes all understanding to meet each and every young person under the sound of my voice exactly where we're at. God, that that peace would give us a strength and endurance that although the waves might come and the winds might come and it might crash against our lives, God, we can turn to you, the one, the prince of peace. Lord, thank you. Thank you that we don't have to be in control of our lives. Thank you that we don't have to worry about tomorrow. Lord, your word says that you clothe the fields with lilies and that you provide food to even the sparrows and the birds of the air. They don't have to worry. How much more do you love us if you take care of grass fields and birds? God, we are your children and you love us so much. Thank you for that great love, Lord. We're grateful. The least we can do is live our lives for you since you gave your life for us. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, we all said a big amen. God's got you. God's got you.